Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello again, listeners, and welcome to another Excelsior edition of Neil Before Pod. I'm your host, Craig McKenzie, and I've assembled the Avengers for more nerdy chat. So with me, I've got Aaron. Hello. And Chris. Hello. And Chris, I think this is your first time on uh, Neil yeah. Before Pod, isn't it? Thank you very much for inviting me along. Yeah, it's my, it's, my, it's my first time doing this. I think it's my first official proper podcast as well. Wow. So, all our thousands of listeners will be wondering, uh, who is this Chris guy? So, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and, and why you're here? Well, I, I was the last minute edition today. I was at the very bottom of the phone book when everyone else wasn't available. Uh, I'm Chris McCrell. I do, <laughs> <laughs> I do a bit of uh, radio presenting on Black Diamond FM across Edinburgh and Midlovian. And the internet, of course. And the internet, of course, at blackdiamondfm.com. I am also a bit of a, a bit of a comic book movie TV fan as well, which makes me, I think, adequately, uh, <laughs> uh, in, Adequate for this podcast, let's put it that way. Yes. And on that note, we're going to talk about uh, Civil War, not the period in American or other countries' history. The uh, the Captain America film released earlier this year with Marvel, also known as the second superhero bout of the summer. After Batman v Superman were tearing lumps out of each other. Which people have made some comparison between this film and Batman v Superman, that's disturbing actually how much of a comparison people have been able to make between those two yeah pretty much everyone i think has has made some kind of comment about how they're from a thematic level they're similar there are two superheroes who fight over an issue or issues their mothers <laughs> yeah well among other things yeah uh so i guess we'll start before i ring some kind of spoiler bell um what do people think of the film uh, without spoiling it, I really no. enjoyed it. I thought it was um, it was a really interesting watch. It was a, a lot of fun in comparison to Batman v Superman. It's I'm, I'm not going to try and compare the two too much, <laughs> but I did find it a much more fun watch than the other one because you've got so so much time invested in these characters already before you get to the film. Uh, I I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I I uh, I liked a lot the first two hours, and then when it got to that two hour mark, the stuff that comes after that that we can we can happily talk about, I really started to to get into a black mood with the whole thing. I think so. First two hours, yeah, definitely enjoyed it. After that, maybe not. Hmm. Um, I would say I pretty much enjoyed it throughout. Although when I was rewatching it at the weekend there be able to take in some notes by the time you get to sort of the big celebrated fight scene you're about an hour and a half into it so it's it's weird that there's another hour on after that one or almost another hour when you get to that point well i don't know how much we're allowed to talk about in the spoiler free section but the second fight that comes in after the two hour mark i, I was thinking did we need this because we've had the first fight yeah. you know that was that maybe that was the seemed like an addition a, a duplication maybe mm. yeah i enjoyed the film though um had a lot of fun with it. I've always liked the Captain America character and I think the films have always represented him very, very well. Uh, and this one's no exception. So it's and some of the characters they introduced that we'll talk about have been really were really interesting. Um because obviously it's a bit of a setup for the future of this franchise with all the higher paid actors coming to the end of their contracts. That's almost the official Avengers theme then isn't it because although I've not seen or read a lot of the comics I think you've always said to me that very much with the Avengers it's about passing on the mantle the team never really stays the same for very long so it's almost like in the real world the actors are copying that here you go yeah. next characters yeah the roster rotate and then they come back and then they leave again and then they come back again and so on it's a very fluid lineup normally isn't it yeah yeah, they, and it tends to be the book's not selling well, so let's bring Iron Man back or something. You know, it is as transparent as that in some cases. But totally suppose, cynical. Yeah. Um, now, there's 
There's been a lot documented about that. You know, they wanted to boost sales, so they brought back certain characters and, and all that stuff. Um, or made them do certain things. I mean, I think Civil War was probably, in the comics, probably a, a financial grab in the first instance, rather than being about telling a good story, necessarily. It was a very impressive way of tying all the characters together, different from the way the movie does it. Yes. Um, because obviously they have access to the whole pool of Marvel characters rather than just the ones that they've got the license for. Yeah, the two versions share a name and very little else. Mm-hmm. Um, in the comic, you've got things like Spider-Man revealing his identity when we only just meet him here and, and a whole multitude of millions of other changes. And as you said, other characters, the Fantastic Four are a big part in the book, for instance, and they're not here. They're too busy being ruined by Fox at this point. They'll be back at some point. <laughs> yeah, they'll come back. So yeah, that's everyone's uh, relayed their initial thoughts. So I guess I'll ring the spoiler sound effect and then we'll continue on. So uh, everyone, prepare for spoilers. Avengers, assemble! Right, now we can say what we want. Yay! Yeah. Uh, so... This is a film about um, conflict between two of the notable superheroes, Iron Man and Captain America. Um, both before and after seeing the film, what kind of side were you leaning towards, if any? Uh, Chris, do you want to go first? Uh, I think before the movie came out, I was kind of siding with Tony or with the Accords, you know, because you don't. Before the film came out, we didn't really know what style the accords were going to be we just knew that that's what they were going to be arguing over at the beginning but i've got to say i was kind of with tony at the beginning because you can't have this sort of power being completely unaccountable for anything going on however you know i I think my mind kind of changed through the movie actually yeah mine changed multiple times actually um Mm. there were sometimes where they'd be having an argument about whatever their principles were at the time, and uh, and I'd be all on Cap's side, and then suddenly Tony would say something, and I'd be like, oh, that's a good point. I think that's one of the best things about the film, actually, was that presentation of both sides. You could find something good in both arguments, and you could yeah. find something negative in both of the characters as you wanted, and it had to be balanced that way, or it really wouldn't have worked. Yeah. Well, I mean, both characters are flawed in the sense that they're very stubborn. So they, you know, they're both sticking to their guns, aren't they? And yeah. neither of them will back down, which means that there has to be a conflict because neither of them will budge on it at all. Well, that's kind of interesting for me because the Captain America character, as was, didn't necessarily seem to have any obvious flaws in the previous film. At least, if he did, I wasn't watching them because I was so blinded by the glory mm. of, of you know his 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 personal uh, ideology. Because I've often thought that the modern Captain America and the modern Superman have totally switched places. Captain America, as he is now, is very much a you know shining sun of of, of humanity. Um, but they had to present him with flaws here, and it was it actually felt a bit like, oh, who is this? This character is slightly different. I, I really felt that. Yeah, I suppose that's a bit of a symptom of him living in the modern age as well. He's kind of exposed to a lot more morally grey stuff than he probably is used to, so it's kind of hard to be um, so committed in your whatever you stand for when everything else is shifting around you. I think his only weakness is probably a bit of naivety at the beginning yeah. that you know everyone is is on the same side everyone's fighting for the same team everyone's very honest and up front where obviously through you know things like winter soldier and everything you learn that's not really the case yeah in terms of sides um since i don't really watch trailers i was kind of predisposed to go with cap because he's a character i like more than iron man but throughout the film as i said i find myself shifting here and there. I found myself agreeing with both of them in different ways. See, I'm going to go totally the opposite of Chris, which sounds like it's a complete setup, but it's it, um, that I have a massive connection to this character. She's definitely my favourite, is Captain America from, from the previous films, mm-hmm. because it is fulfilling that old need that I think I had as a kid, watching these real heroes, uh, and, and he definitely is a real hero in, in those films, and before I'd seen any trailers, for me, I mean, I remember having this conversation with, with, with you actually, Craig. I said, it doesn't matter what gets said. 
I am on the side of Captain America because <laughs> that person presented to me in the first two films, it was like he couldn't be wrong. Yeah. There's these brilliant speeches that he gives that inspires everybody else. I'm thinking, I am not in your world. I'm sitting here watching you and I am inspired to go and do these things. And then even in just the first half an hour, I think, when the Accords gets mentioned, I totally flipped to uh, – to, to Tony Stark and then I was with Tony throughout the whole film and that was pretty shocking f- for me to, to, to think about that but it, it suddenly became clear I think to me that these accords could only be signed uh, so it could only be ignored by somebody who was actually the glorious son of humanity so this Captain America that I was seeing in, in films one and two he did not need to sign those accords because he would never make a mistake but all of the other characters are human, yeah. uh, effectively human. And, and so they, I mean, as soon as I saw it, I thought, well, the rest of them need to sign because they will be compromised. And then in the film, he is immediately compromised. And I thought the whole argument for Captain America's side seemed to completely collapse in my head. Maybe just because it was a bit of a shock of losing that purity, but. Yeah, I, I totally switched sides. I was with Tony Stark all the way from about halfway, uh, half an hour in. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because um, Steve he blames himself for um, essentially the accords getting pushed through because um, he blames himself for not noticing that bomb before it was too late, which you know forced Wanda to throw um, crossbones off in some random direction just to get him out of there, which of course caused a lot of deaths. But then he sort of says, but that's the way it is. You made a mistake yeah. and we have to move on. So he doesn't seem to be, whether he might feel guilty, it's not to the extent that it seems to completely cripple him. It is just, well, this is how you have to move on, Wanda. You need to be able to deal with it and I'm going to help you do that. Yeah, and, that, and that's real in the sense of him serving in World War Two, isn't it? I mean, there's we, we don't actually ever see it, but there's bound to be campaigns that he goes on where not everyone made it back alive and where people screwed up a little bit. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the thing is, that final event with the bomb is the only one where you can really point at and go, well, those extra deaths were your fault. Mm-hmm. All the other events that the, the sort of general lists as he goes through sort of alien invasions of New York and all this are, are nothing to do with them, really. They they defended against them, but that yeah. bomb going off is the, and, you know, causing injury is, is the one thing that they can be sort of blamed for. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at the New York thing, that was that was happening anyway, and they needed to react to it. And it was actually the the legitimate uh, government, uh, well, through Shield, that wanted to nuke the city. So, you know, it's a bit rich them talking about collateral damage when they were about to do that. Uh, and in terms but, of the the Washington stuff, um, that was it, it was either that or thousands of people, millions of people are killed for this kind of world order that Hydro wanted. Also caused by by government at, yeah. the, at the at the end of it, you know. So for the government to then turn around and say, "Well, look at what you caused," it's like, "Well, look at what potentially would have happened." Yeah, and Age of Ultron was entirely Tony Stark's fault. That's got to be fair then, when the government comes along and says Sokovia, end of argument. Yeah, yeah. You know, that wasn't them. Yeah, that's the only thing that wasn't us. <laughs> Although that was pretty big because it was made clear from Zemo. Yeah. No, it was. Yeah, it was clearly a big thing, and I really liked how um, when they're showing the footage of all these kind of big scale battles, you're seeing it from a perspective that you haven't seen before. It's almost a found footage thing. Some guy with a camera on the ground who gets crushed by rubble. Right. Um, which from the position that we would probably be in, standing yeah. under there, going, "Oh no! Yeah. Oh look, the Hulk just hit something <laughs> above me. I'm dead." The thing about that as well, though, is I'm, I'm thinking that even though that's true for the previous films, when you watch what Captain America gets stuck into this film, it, it seems like it, it is totally changed. Because I'm thinking of when he goes to rescue Bucky mm-hmm. the first time and immediately those policemen are killed and they are definitely killed. You know, there's this... We see bricks to the chests and so on. And then I think at some point 
either Tony Stark or or the the the, the government guy says there were five deaths in that raid, and you're thinking, well, yeah, so. Your choice there, Captain America, was to go and save your friend, and you immediately caused the deaths of five innocent people by doing so. And that never seems to come up. And it's mm. acknowledged in by other characters, so it's definitely there. But he's like, I, I had to do this to save my friend. And you're thinking, no, you have to think of these innocent people that you're constantly talking about. Yeah. I guess, I mean, if you look at it from a knowledge point of view, he was, he was going into that situation not knowing what state of mind Bucky would be in. So I guess the idea is if they left him to his own devices, then how much more, how much more death could he cause? Because obviously he doesn't trust um, SWAT teams or whatever to bring him in, since he's the Winter Soldier. I think I think you're right, and I think it is a difficult stunt situation for him to be in. But it's just from my perspective, I came out of watching him in two previous films where he talks about this strong ideology, and in that moment of that strong ideology. There seems to be a lot of times where you just need to defend. You just need to try and talk. Like with the mm. soldiers, you kind of want him to just stand in the way with his shield. Does he really need to be twatting away at these people all the time? I mean, I know it leads into a fight, and that's where it gets complicated, and Bucky's mm. certainly swinging, so whether he likes it or not, he's in. But even if I say, oh, that complication comes up afterwards, where's the regret? Where's the reflection? Where's mm. the... Bucky, I need to bring you in now because you just killed five policemen. Yeah. I totally get that the other thing is bad for you. We need to make sure that you your you being framed is undone, but tough. You just killed five guys. So I'm taking you in now. Yeah. And that, that never seems to really come up. No, it does get buried among the the rest of the stuff that's going on. Um, after the after the raid with Bucky he is very close to then signing those accords. I mean, he has the pen in his hand yeah, at he's that thinking point. About it, yeah. He's thinking about it. He's so close. And then it just switches again. Um, and he, the, the pen's down and he, he, he doesn't sign. That, that, I think, is at the point where he's closest to going, do you know what, actually, this is a good idea. Yeah, I think it it shifts when Tony brings up Wanda and how she's not, uh, she's currently not in um, in active duty. And brings up the fact that she's not a U.S. citizen as well, um, which is interesting because they clearly brought her into the country illegally um, after the last film. So I think um, Steve would be surprised that Tony might think of her like that. But then again, he hasn't been around, so it's at least as much as he has, so it's difficult. It's interesting how Wanda seemed to be that trigger to him not signing. Well, she was the innocent that was already in trouble because, you know, under his under Cap's watch, one of his soldiers, Ari Wander, had, had 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 a problem that killed some people, and and it was his soldier, it's his responsibility. So I can see why she would be the trigger because yeah. it's it's pointing out something that he believes Captain America believes he should have dealt with. Yeah, although um, with that situation, inaction would have done the exact same thing. I mean, if uh, if they'd have let. Um, crossbones go off he would have probably killed more people just in the crowd um, yeah but it's in the modern world it's all about what you see it's about what actually happened isn't it you're not mm. gonna the newspapers aren't going to report uh 20 people die when 50 could have done you know that's yeah. never going to come up so <laughs> yeah it is a very realistic sort of scenario of well they would never report how many people survived or how many would have potentially been put at risk by uh, that vial of uh, you know the chemical weapon escaping yeah. uh, they don't put any of that in but you know modern media as it is would always report on what, what has happened you know the uh, collateral damage yeah no, definitely um, in terms of the accords I mean we only get a kind of superficial look at what they what they are because you know the film can't take us through that 10,000 page document that they're passing around <laughs> Um you get more of an idea of what they actually are in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. actually, but in the, in the context of this film, it's just... It, 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 the simple thing is the, um, they're supposed to keep the Avengers under government control, so they have to be tasked to go places by, uh, by you know, a United Nations task force who tell them where to go and what to do and who to save and all that stuff. And I can really understand why Steve would be against that because obviously it's about choice for him. You know, and he thinks if he thinks he should go and help someone, he's going to do it regardless of what some 
piece of paper said. I think that's the problem with it, though. Again, it comes down to the fact that he has been constructed almost by God, and I almost use that religious statement purposely based on the fact that he gets his realization in the church, but he, he he's almost constructed to be this perfect being where he can actually make decisions based on his gut instinct about what he knows is right. Mm. And there seems to be this blindness that that is not human, that's not normal. You know, Everybody should just make these decisions as if they, they they can trust their heart and say, well, okay, if we let everybody in the world do that, then either everybody would be killed by all the villains instantly, or you're saying that you don't believe there would be any villains out there, in which case there is no problem in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, and for Stark, it's about accountability. I mean, his motivation for this film seems to be just guilt. Uh, he's feeling guilty over everything that's happened and all the deaths that he's had an indirect part in. Um, but for Steve, he saw what happened when when he worked for Shield and all those agendas. I mean, he uses the word agendas uh, as if it's a bad thing because they change. And and he saw that with Shield. You know, he he knew that the, someone had an agenda to build these helicarriers that were going to wipe out people that might be dangerous one day. And I guess he's probably slightly blinded by that. That's what he expects, maybe. I mean, he's a he's a soldier in the end of the day, Captain America, or he was a soldier. And he followed his orders and discovered that the people that were in power were not actually the good guys. In the end, he's been burnt by following a contract before, mm. which is probably why he's not wanting to tie himself into, into that again, though obviously the United Nations, we hope, is slightly different from Hydra. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you know, it's he's he's been there before. He's been told where to go, who to fight, who to capture, and it turned out he was doing it for the wrong reasons. But he was following orders at that mm. time. I think he's not scared, but he doesn't want to put himself in that position again where he can't say no. He probably especially works quite well, even if you don't have the background knowledge of the films. If you just have watched the news, because you could actually make the argument that. The UN as is isn't something you'd want to sign over the Avengers to because we've all seen on the news that they are incapable of really forcing a ceasefire in Syria. They are famously teased as being a paper tiger. They, they are a massive bureaucracy that can't make decisions and we all yeah. want them to be this power. I mean, he's probably right. They, they would not, they would just not use the Avengers because it would take three months to deploy them. Yeah. They would spend so long debating them. By the time the debate's finished, Thanos has destroyed the world. You know, but at least uh, the, at least there was an embargo, and he wasn't allowed to import anything into the <laughs> uh, country at the time. Yeah, yeah, In, imports the Infinity Gauntlet, but yes. <laughs> he's not got permission to get that through customs. <laughs> no, <laughs> I do yeah. think the film does quite well though with presenting the opposite argument to that, though through Tony Stark. Uh, at no point do you think that Tony is just a bureaucratic nightmare who just wants to get as much red tape in as possible that that guilt as you say that he's got it makes it a very human argument and that was one of the most important things for me that that side of it that we must restrict ourselves we must put some pen to paper and it must be official had to still be human yeah. otherwise we all would have immediately just signed up with with cap yeah well i mean if you look back at uh, the first two Iron Man films or the first Avengers film, uh, Stark's stance is, uh, no, the only safe place for this technology is with me, so I'm not going to turn it over to any government. Uh, and now his tune has changed. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that's to do with the guilt he feels. I mean, there's there's all sorts of uh, stuff, you know, where he's confronted with that, that dead boy's mother who makes him yes. feel guilty about the fact that they were in Sokovia. But he seems to be ignoring how much worse the situation would have been if they hadn't been involved as well. Well, that's why it's an impossible choice, though, isn't yeah. it? That, that is what makes the film, the fact that there is actually no good answer, because if there was, then our United Nations would just be pushing that button every single time. Fix me button, fix me button. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, arguably, if the Avengers were under government control, then Ultron would never have existed in the first place. Yeah. Although I can't imagine Stark would have decided, no, nah, I'm not going to do that, just because the government says that I shouldn't. 
I mean, the thing is, uh, Tony breaks the the accords himself. He decides, do you know what? I'm I'm not going to hand them in. I'm not going to say where yeah. where he is. I'm going to go myself. Yeah, without it's, telling anyone. He, yeah, he, he just when it suits follows, him. Yeah, exactly. He does. You know. So, and like you're saying, it would have still happened. Mm. He still he still goes rogue. He breaks it himself. You know. So it's it's hard to support once he. He sort of realizes actually this doesn't work in every situation. I've got to, I've got to get in here myself. Mm. I think actually that's where that's one of the things about the two hour marker that started to slightly bother me um, because they the 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 balance that they've carried throughout the whole rest of the film, which leads up to even just the fight and the action side as well as the ideological argument. It almost feels like we just. And now the bad guy is here, so we need to just focus everything on defeating him. And that ideology seems to vanish in the face of Zemo. Yeah, well, I mean, the conflict changes, uh, the personal conflict changes anyway. I mean, at first it's about the fact that Cap is outside the law, and Stark seems to not be listening to the fact that um, Cap wants to stop Zemo from getting the other Winter Soldiers. Because that's obviously a dangerous thing, and they should be focusing on that, and, and no one seems to be listening to that. But by the end, it's more of a, a personal thing. It's more about how Steve lied to him about Bucky killing his parents, specifically yeah. his mother. Well, for the whole "you killed my mother" storyline, I think I mean is is just I don't know. It feels like it's going back so many years in storytelling. How can I get this person angry? I know we'll kill their mother. You know? Yeah, it, that even that seemed a bit weak to me, but. I think I would have rather the end bit been more of a how does this current situation resolve based on our decision of whether or not to sign the accords. I, I would have rather that ending than this, This oh, we need to get the two of them into a desperate fight and we need to get them angry. And they built it up well. They got them angry about personal things and it is built right from the start and it's all very well and done. But I think it... Just because the ending dodges what seems like the most important issue throughout most of the film, I just felt like I, I feel like we've missed something here. Yeah, I think a big part of the problem for me is Zemo. Um, his plan is one of those needlessly complicated ones, and you know, um, on his trailers they do it. They nailed it as they always do, uh, and put a list of every step of his plan. And um, when you actually read it written down and how many steps it is, it's really. It does seem a bit ridiculous, but his goals are quite simple. He wants to do just two things. He wants to destroy those other Winter Soldiers, and he wants to tear the Avengers apart. So the film essentially combines those two into one big, massive, overly complicated thing that needs a lot of coincidences. A lot of luck. Yeah. A lot, a lot of luck. Yeah. I have to hope that this draws the Winter Soldier out of hiding and causes Cap to do this so that he gets captured so that I can go in and uh, speak to this guy and so on, you know... Yeah, <laughs> but it's a shame as well, actually, because again, his basic motivation comes from the argument of the accords themselves. Because it's Sokovia, where they've done a lot of damage, rather than just twenty, fifty people, which is of course a bad thing. But Sokovia is is pretty much pointed out to be you know hundreds of people here, so it yeah. feels like he had a real personal problem that could have fed directly into a resolution about the accords, but then it. It just, got, yeah, but then it's it's his massive super plan is instead to get the two of them fighting, and then it's about what we what we must see Cap versus with Iron Man instead of what the premise of the film seems to have been from the start. I mean, I do like the fact that Zemo is not the sort of standard end of play Marvel villain where it turns into a massive CGI battle between one conjured up army. And the Avengers. I mean, it makes a change yeah. for it to be facing them against themselves, and not to end in this massive CGI fest at the end. That's, yeah, that's definitely true. That's yeah. the one advantage of Zemo as as the villain in this piece, it, though his plan is a bit ridiculous. Yeah, he's, I think he's supposed to be a much more human adversary for them, um, and obviously he's supposed to be clever, which he sort of is. But again, his plan is very kind of. Well, this needs to happen, and this needs to happen. But convoluted. Yeah, yeah, there's no way he could predict certain things were going to happen in the way that he needed them to. Um, but it's, I, I must admit, I was surprised when they they caught up with him and he killed those other Winter Soldiers. I think that was just. Uh, um, I think that was actually just the way the plot had to handle a side event. You thought I was going for these people, but I have just killed them 
as I go, because actually it was nothing to do with that. So he yeah. really had no interest in them whatsoever. It was just the red herring, and then the plot, and then the film needed to deal with it. Yeah. He also kind of wanted to take them off the map in case anybody wanted to use them, I suppose. Well, he, he says that, but it, yeah. it really isn't important to his plan whatsoever. It's just something he thinks to do whilst he's there. Mm. I mean, he was there getting the evidence. He was there getting the tape of yeah, the event. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it seems to be that he, he had to go all the way there for, was just to get the evidence to make Tony fight. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, you know, you, you would think that at the end he would go, well, actually, I might, I might need some uh, henchmen to get me out of this at the end. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I probably regrets when he gets caught at the end not having a spare henchman around. Well, I mean, he, once he, it seemed that once he tore them apart, he was content to just end his life right there. It's kind of what he was living for because he was sitting out in the, on the snow and he deleted his wife's message and he was ready to shoot himself. That was actually a really good ending. In, in fact, that was one of my favourite parts about the whole ending. I didn't like, like too much after the two-hour mark, fine, but I'll say that bit I really liked. And I also liked that Black Panther, as you as you, you sort of said, Chris, it's not a fight. He sits down and has a talk with the guy. Yeah. And then right at the end, even better, he stops him killing himself. And that, to me, is just that, that was a brilliant ending, you mm. know. Yeah, it was. it was a bit more interesting in terms of you know you're making someone that didn't think they would ever have to face up to what they've done uh, suddenly have to uh, again it's accountability you know Zemo is now accountable for everything he's done yeah which does fit the accord slightly it is more of a legal situation and at the end we get to say right you are going to be accountable to the law for what you've done that to me does fit the theme as protected right from the start yeah yeah it's 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 a tough one because I mean there is essentially two conflicts going on the the accords and the conflict between uh, Steve and Tony isn't aren't really the same thing. Um, they disagree on the accords, but they're at least by the end their conflict is is different. It's not really about that anymore. The thing yeah. is, Zemo wouldn't have known that the accords and all those events were going to happen. You know, it just happens that these two events are happening at the exact same time. It's possible that if Zemo's plan wasn't ongoing at the same point, that the the accords might have been signed by everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. And would they have been so angry at us at each other at all? They would have been somewhat angry, but would there be would they would the two characters have been angry enough to actually fight if there hadn't have been the accords? Yeah, maybe he was incredibly lucky. Yeah, well, I mean, Zemo frames Bucky, which makes Cap break the Accords by, you know, acting alone to bring him in. So that's fine. So if Zemo didn't do that, then Cap would never have found Bucky, probably. At least not at that point. So I wonder what he would have done at that point. Would he have just refused to sign and then sit there until something happens? That be an enforced retirement. Yeah. <laughs> but he would have just <laughs> he would have just sat there until something came up that he couldn't ignore. Peggy's funeral still would have confused it would have convinced him to not sign surely yeah. yeah it would just be waiting for some other tragic event that spurs him into action again i suppose mm. i don't know what that might have been but um that's interesting yeah zemo definitely gets it moving in terms of uh putting steve and tony at odds with one another uh but other than that it seems no, it seems his plan is kind of divorced from what else is going on. Everything else after that, between them two anyway, happens because they are the people that they are. It's, it's difficult. I think um, the issue is much more complex than the film lets play out, I think. Uh, it, I think, it, yeah, it probably is. That, and I think that's why I might have liked more focus on those issues because they're not doing what the comics have done, they've taken a whole new angle by themselves, which is a great angle mm -hmm. because it's relevant to today. It is, we have got conflicts in in Libya, Iraq, Syria, where ideally somebody stupidly powerful would go in and just say, right, I'm in charge, stop fighting. Yeah. Well, we want the UN to do that. Here in this world, we have these super powerful beings that can actually do it. So you've got this really lovely, relevant argument, and it it really would have, I really would have liked to have seen more of that play out. Not to bring it back to Batman versus Superman again with 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 too much levity, but 
they did do that. They did have this relevant argument of, is this character human and what would you do in that case? I think this film, this Civil War, could have used a, a bit more of their own suggested topic. Yeah. And funnily enough, it skirts around the character of Vision, who's an artificial life form and the first artificial life form ever, at least as far as they know. Uh, and he's a public figure in a lot of ways. You know, he's a registered member of the Avengers and, and all that stuff. So I wonder, it's interesting that the film doesn't even tackle the fact that what people might think of him. Maybe he's not known. I don't know. Is he on the news? Has he been shown as a public figure? Maybe he's, yeah, maybe, I've yeah. thought of that, but maybe he's just not actually in the public eye yet. Although if the Avengers are a sort of public organisation, or they want to make them a, um, at least a visible organisation, then it's definitely going to come up. So I'm, I'm, sort of, They've got that other problem with Vision, though. It, it's, I do remember watching one of the cartoons when, when Vision steps in, and he, I, he's almost got the Superman problem. Ideally, you would just send Vision on every mission. He yeah. can just do everything. There is no reason to send Cap and a team of people. Vision, just go and solve that problem, please. And they would just do it. So it does, it does actually make you wonder why isn't he on the first mission when he could have just solved that bomb problem straight away with whatever power he's got. Yeah. But they don't bring him out. They don't use him, and he's not in public. So imagine his, um, imagine his absence on that initial mission is probably a, a mechanical script thing. You know, they couldn't think of anything for him to do. Or if he yeah, was there, just... it would resolve it too quickly. Because yeah. yes. War Machine's missing there as well, and he's on the team, at least oh, yeah, by that... the end of Avengers 2. They, they don't use, they, yeah, they don't use everybody. They need, yeah. they probably would have multiple problems at the same point, and there's no reason not to split the team into into little bits, but you should still always, with your best player, put them on the worst problem. Yeah. Maybe he was cooking dinner at the time. <laughs> Which is definitely the worst problem, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I you find really it. need something better to eat tonight. Yeah, get vision on it. <laughs> he was trying out different types of stew. <laughs> or or um, shopping for new jumpers. Yeah, he was trying on new Argyle sweaters. <laughs> yeah, the fashion problem, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I find it really interesting that Vision is still essentially doing Jarvis's job in the Avengers compound. He's, uh, you know, he tells people when... when People are on the phone, or people have arrived. Well, he's got no purpose other than that. He's not allowed yeah. out on missions, you know. He says, "Well, can I just do my old job for a bit longer? Yeah. I won't be. You don't have to pay me. I'll just do it." Oh yeah, carry on. <laughs> so he just wanders about, saying, "Stark's here." Absolutely. <laughs> and Stark's yeah. here. Phone's ringing. Dinner's on. Yeah. <laughs> I've washed your suit. <laughs> and that brings us on naturally to the other characters, I suppose. Unless anybody has anything else to say about. Steve and, and Tony. Uh, Steve has disappointed me. Tony is the new new ideal for me. So happy with that. <laughs> well, there was one thing about Tony that I thought actually as I was watching it. Um, there's a there's a sort of hint, maybe in, more so in Downey Junior's performance rather than anything else, that there's something not quite right with him. Uh, he seems out of sorts, and and there's a bit where um, it's just after the the attack on the the compound in Germany where he, he sort of rubs his chest and says, my left arm's numb, is that normal? Isn't that where he's just taken a serious beating without his suit on? Though? Yeah, maybe. I mean, you might be right, but I think it was just the fact that he was just a, a normal human in a fight and that everybody else is taking kicks to the chest and they can yeah. take it because they're superheroes and, and he is actually a bloke mm. at that point. He's also supposed to be reeling, I suppose, from, from missing Pepper. He's, he's not got that sounding board yeah. that he's used to having. So he's he's you know keeping everything to himself. He's building it up inside. He's probably making it worse than he is, and he doesn't have this other sounding board that he can go to and go. This is what I'm thinking at the moment. Tell me I'm stupid. Hmm. Yeah, he can't even talk to Jarvis. Yeah, he's got Friday and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose I'd forgotten about the. I guess um, I'm so used to watching these things where normal humans take massive beatings and then they just they're walking around normally five minutes later. <laughs> um. I suppose, yeah, he could have been the most injured out of anyone during that, that conflict. Yeah, the, yeah, they do give him a black eye, I think. Yeah, so. yeah there's an awful lot of black eye makeups and makeups in these films. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess other characters um, could start with, well, we've already kind of discussed Vision. Um, it's interesting how he's figuring out or trying to figure out what he is and who he is and his place in the world. You know, the bit where he talks about the... Um, the the main gem is is something that he doesn't understand, so he kind of he's terrified of it, even though it gives him life. 
I mean, the thing is, by the end of the film, he'd be even more terrified of it than he was before, yeah. considering what happens. Yeah. You know, the, you know, at the very end of the film, you're sort of seeing a, a, he's, he, he's broken. He, he doesn't want to act. He doesn't want to move. He doesn't want to you know, do anything. And, you know, it leaves, you know, potentially one of the most powerful members of the team, you know, a bit, a bit nerfed. He, you know, he, he won't be able to do anything. Mm. Scared to act. Yeah. And I think there's a... I mean, there's got to be an arc in there for him somewhere. I think that, I don't know, something will have to happen with him that that helps him define what he what he really stands for as such. I mean, he just kind of... He, he fits in the background here, which is fine, but by the time Thanos comes, you know, Thanos is going to rip that gem out of his head. Yeah, his uh, future character development is to become an ornament on a glove. Yeah. Yeah, but I wonder if his personality is in the gem or not, you know, and whether that could factor in, I don't know. But um, having him around is is complicated because he is very powerful. It's always a struggle with the team when you're when you're looking at you know you're comparing someone like Vision to Black Widow, or you know it's it, it's it's how you sort of put all those teams together. You know, Black Widow and Hawkeye are probably two of the most vulnerable team members that you've got. Yeah in comparison to the others that are out there because some of them have got nice armoured suits the other two are sort of running about in leather <laughs> with, a, you know, with a bow and arrow or you know, a, a couple of pistols mm. it's, um, it's very difficult to try and place those characters and I thought actually the way they handled all these you know, not wanting to do them a disservice but all these ancillary characters that you've seen throughout the films how do they react? What side do they pick and why? Mm. And they seem just as conflicted as everyone else, where they can see both points and they don't know quite where they should go. Yeah, although if you look at Hawkeye and Ant-Man, they sign up to help with help Captain America, but you don't you don't get an, a sense of why they're doing it. I mean, I, I mentioned those two because they are leaving behind children. I think actually, despite that... Mm, I think everybody did actually get a chance to come in as their fits their character. Cause I, I think you get that impression from Hawkeye. He is just a soldier. Well, just is not fair. He's a soldier as well. And he does what he thinks is right. And he says, no, I, I, I am definitely following this route because it feels right. And, mm-hmm. and Ant-Man is just, oh, I'm so glad to be asked on the <laughs> Avengers. You guys are my heroes. I would have gone with either team. It's just whoever first <laughs> asked me. And that fits with who they are, definitely. Yeah. You- I mean, I think Hawkeye is another one of these characters that, you know, you, you've seen before in the films all the way back to four in the first four film where he was working for S.H.I.E.L.D. He was mm-hmm. doing S.H.I.E.L.D.'s bidding, ultimately Hydra again. So another character that would have a reason to go... I don't trust other people telling me what I should be doing. Yeah, yeah maybe. Although, I mean, uh, Hawkeye's, uh, Hawkeye's decision was that he was going to leave all this behind anyway until, I guess, Cap asked for his help and he came back into action. But, the, the you know, the fact that he's... It results in him get put in a pretty heavy security prison. In fact, the heaviest security prison you can think of at the end. And then, obviously, he gets broken out at the end of the film by, by Steve, but... He's still on the run, and he still can't see his kids again. But and, two people always think about the consequences before they act. Yeah. I, don't, I'm, I think you can get away with that just simply by saying he did what he felt he had to do. He hoped, like in every other case, that it would be fine. Mm. He got out of an alien invasion, okay, so he must be pretty confident that he could get out of a small earthbound fight all right, <laughs> especially with people that were essentially his mates, because he gets into a fight with Black Widow and you know they're not going to try and kill each other. Yeah. Which is a strange limitation on that fight when it comes up, actually, the, the big fight. And how many of you are really going to do what a fight requires in this <laughs> case and put each other down properly? Probably not many of them. No. Well, not really any of them. I think probably Black Panther is the only one that wants to actually do harm to anyone else. Yeah. Um, I mean, you do look at them and think, are, are are you genuinely going to finish this fight, or are you? Would it just continue forever and ever and ever? Because you know none of them want to to really hit each other. Yeah, it was at all. toy you know, fighting. Yeah, you do you do find it very very strange that these very very powerful 
you know, and still somehow Hawkeye and Black Widow <laughs> are running around. You're like, you would be the first ones to go. Uh, it's, it's, you know, this would not be the way this is going. You know, obviously they're wanting each other to live. Yeah. But both, both do, teams... are they trying to disable each other? Are they just trying to make the other one go, oh, do you know what? We, ju- we just won't do it. We've, we've decided we've refought it. You know. Yeah. They're trying to fight to a surrender rather than fight to a, a, a defined defeat, I think. And I think that's why, at the end, you know, Hawkeye would be like, well, if we lose, I'll just get sent back home and told, don't interfere again. Mm, you know, yeah. I don't think at that point they believe there will be consequences. Yeah, Quite, yeah, I think that covers it. Yeah, I suppose. So Hawkeye's there for, for Cap, and then... Just, yeah. see, seeing as you mentioned these people then, mm. I, I, Brody was one of the interesting ones for me in the initial discussions because he does actually throw himself into the argument. Yeah. And I really like that because he's a soldier as well, but they don't actually push that stereotype too hard. I was very pleased to see somebody who says, I'm on missions, I am an army man, come in with and get involved in the debate, in the arguments. Especially when he says to Captain America that Cap's argument is dangerously arrogant yeah and i thought yeah get in there tell yeah. him what's right it's quite a cutting statement yeah and it's one soldier to another as well it is yeah, yeah. i think it's all the more important perhaps because of that yeah i mean i do think it the 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 thing about war machine and in, in the end is i think that was a character that i expected to die by the end of this hmm. when he suffered that fall I did not think that that character would go at the end and go, oh, it's all right, he's just done his leg in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's that that was a fall from a very high height in a in a iron suit. Yeah. That you, you don't come out crash. you don't come out of that with padding. It's oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that character is gone and I I wonder why the result in the end there wasn't that someone died. You know, right. it seems at this point, like, all these characters are immortal. They're just never, they're they're always going to be around. There's never going to be high stakes. Yeah. Because at the end of it, they fall from such great heights. They, Like you say, you've never seen sort of uh, Tony Stark go, oh, should my arm be a bit numb? You know, mm. that's about the most of the injury at the end of it. And you're going, hang on, this, this pe- these people have been through a huge fight. One of them hey. has fallen from the sky. What, <laughs> you know? I actually didn't mind the fact that he died. I've seen across the internet everybody saying he should have died, and obviously, realistically, he should have done. But I think, to a certain extent, it's more horrible when the person does live, because we should actually get to a moment in a in a following film that Captain America comes face to face with Rhodey and has to see, oh yeah, you're the guy I completely crippled and ruined to your life. You know, yeah. I, I've managed to completely and conveniently forget that I've caused the death of five policemen, but here I am forced to deal with it because you are standing there right in front of me. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm pleased that he's still alive because I think it will actually be all the more grim. Also, not- it's entirely possible that, that Tony will have invented something that uh, completely heals him. By the, the next Maybe. film, you know. Well, you, you, he's got the he's, he's got the new leg by the yeah. end of the film. You know, he's already working on that. So you can imagine by a couple of films' time, he'll be running about just like nobody's business, just with yeah. a full metal leg. Yeah. But I mean, I I do think that the death of Rudy would have pushed Tony even further. You know, it 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 would have made the relationship unrepairable mm. by the end of it, without even seeing the the footage of his mother getting killed by Bucky. It it would have pushed him right to that point where you're like, he's not going to stop. He's he's going to finish this now. Yeah, and I probably would have preferred that too than the than the dead mother thing, which just seems so cheap. Whereas somebody that you've you've clearly seen a friendship building since um, since the first Iron Man film, that would have been more powerful than a, a random relative. Yeah, yeah, that, that might have been more interesting if yeah, Rory had been the, the collateral damage in there. Um, I guess maybe they just like working with the actor, so they don't want to get rid of the character as well. He is a fun character. I do yeah. like seeing him around. I just think the char- the motivations for the other characters at that point would have been pushed so much further. Mm. I mean, would other people then have sided with Captain America? Would they all have swapped allegiances by that point and went, oh my God, we've just killed one of our own number in yeah. this fight. What have we done? Or, you know, it would it would have completely alienated Captain America by that point. Yeah, or in the same way that people were afraid of uh, Wanda 
earlier on, they would have that that fear would extend to Vision, who seems to be this uncontrollable force. Uh, you know, even when he is on the side of the the angels, so to speak, because uh, it is. Well, I mean, it's indirectly his fault because he's aiming at Falcon, and Falcon moves out of the way. You know, and and the beam hits Rory, but. Um, I would have liked to see you know people be a bit terrified of Vision afterwards as well because he is very dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. I think she'd even be terrified of Wanda because honestly, what limits are to her power? Is yeah. it, I mean, she can just do anything now, and she doesn't use her mind control anymore. Because what she should have done, actually, this is probably on the internet somewhere. <laughs> She should have just used her mind control thing like she did in, in Ultron. And then uh, you're not fighting anymore. You're here, you're here, you're here, and it's all over. Yeah. So they sh- people should be terrified of this girl because she is uh, presented almost as powerful as Vision at the moment. Yeah, it, that's consistent with the comics as well. Whenever they need some world-changing thing to happen, they, um, they get Scarlet Witch involved because uh, she can do that. Um, And... I guess the limitation she has at the moment is she's still f- figuring out her abilities. Although she had a pretty good command of them in Age of Ultron in terms of the mind control, as you said. Well, she had pretty good control of her ability to squash vision in this one. I mean, yeah, we're talking about of. vision being this scary, and she can, in a matter of moments, just put him down. Yeah. So, by association, she's even more powerful. No, oh, yeah, she definitely is. I think there's going to be more done with her in future films. I don't know if they'll ever go as far as doing the House of M story where she rewrites the the universe to a way that she likes it or not. But um you know, they could do something like that where she does where she does something. Uh, I think she'll be pivotal the pivotal in the att- uh, fight with Thanos, certainly. She could be, yeah. You know, it, it's these these characters, I mean you, you have got to wonder, I know we're going to talk about it later, what the impact of this film will be on, so I'll keep my thoughts uh, <laughs> my thoughts on that <laughs> until later. But but yeah, I mean, a lot of these characters could be very pivotal later on. Mm. I mean, a, a lot of the characters you're looking at are your your sort of side Avengers team. You know, they're going to be they're going to be running ops on their own yeah. without the oversight, and you're going to have another team that do have the oversight. And you know what happens when those two potentially meet somewhere mm. when they both have the same bright idea. Yeah, I, I like the way the, the films handle Wanda. I've always thought she was an interesting character in the comics, and uh, and as she gets older, the way she, her thoughts change on what she can do and and what that all means. And there's sort of at the uncertainty stage at the moment. She doesn't quite know what she's capable of, and she's almost terrified of it in some ways. It's like when well, she, I... when she attacks Vision, she seems visibly afraid of what she's actually doing. I think my problem with that is, even though that circumstance by itself is actually uh, somewhat interesting, the young woman who's very attractive, who has infinite power and is trying to find how to use it, is just, I've seen this so many times before, it's everything that you have to give to the fanboys to make them happy, and it's and it's sort of no longer interesting because where are they going to take that she looks a bit upset when she does something in this film it worked but if they make it a massive deal we're going right back to Buffy the Vampire Slayer again and every single powerful young woman in between it's I think it's 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 dangerous territory to go over it just again yeah well maybe next time we see her she'll have gone undergone more more training and she'll be um and she'll be fully confident in her abilities and know what her limitations are if she has any I hope they do something different with it. I don't know what that is, but yeah, I hope they yeah. do something different with her to, to previous similar characters. Yeah, you know, I think she is the kind of character that could end up corrupted herself. Mm. You know, it's it, it's one of those if her own power gets turned against her, what you know, what could happen? Yeah, and in the comics, uh, it's hinted at here as well. She um, she marries Vision for a while. Um, they get divorced eventually, but it's you know they, they do get married, and it's a big deal because it's like a mutant as she was in the comics, and an android. So it's kind of this weird pairing that, that people are uh, find noteworthy. So, um, And there's hints of that relationship starting to form in this film, because they spend a lot of scenes together, and there's hints that, that Vision is quite fond of her. Although it does seem quite one way at the moment, Pearl and Vision side, but yeah. maybe maybe in the future. Yeah, it could grow, yeah. Um, who knows? Those are kind of the, the side characters that don't get a huge amount of focus, but other characters did get... A proper introduction 
Falcons, one of them being Black Panther, we've already mentioned, but um, I thought his role in the film was, was really good, apart from the, the pipe music that kept playing every time they introduced him. You know, that was, uh, that was starting to get annoying. After you need to know that he's from Africa. <laughs> yeah. you know, that is not determinable by any other method. So. <laughs> yeah. It needs to be really obvious. It's like if, it, if it's a Scottish character, it needs bagpipes <laughs> and, and, and a lot of tartan. Yeah. yeah. But sort of almost everything from his comic book self is there. You know, he's got the agility, he's, the, he's got his intelligence, he's, he has his resources because he's a, essentially a king. He's powerful. Well, his suit makes him powerful. And uh, and you've got that whole, it almost does his origin in this film, which makes me wonder what his, his actual film is going to be about. You know, his origin being his father dies and he has to take on the mantle of king. Yeah. Yeah. Although I think the most interesting thing about him actually was the fact that his identity was not hidden. Mm. As soon as he gets caught, he just takes his mask off, and then the police realize, "Oh yes, we can't arrest you because you're a prince." Yeah. And it's Diplomatic almost like he's got this, guys. Yeah, yeah. he's got this second set of superpowers that he can just <laughs> unveil by taking his mask off. It's yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and he interacts well with with different characters. I like how him and Black Widow seem to have a bit of a an understanding, um, and they get along well whenever they speak because they're both sort of strong-willed and, and all that stuff he, he does he, I, I mean he seems like a, a really interesting character to explore further on yeah I mean the the death of his father gives him the the strong motivation yeah you know to for the for the rest of the film but I, I would be interested in seeing sort of the training of that character how does he discover what he's you know what he's going to do and wh- where does he take it from there now that the Wakandan are sort of coming out of their shell again, mm. starting to appear on the scene because it sounds like from the previous films that they've been very insular up to that point. Yeah, you know, so what's going to happen beyond there? Yeah, the I suspect a solo film will have a lot of flashbacks to his childhood and all that stuff. I mean, it is you know the Black Panther film is the last you know character that we're going to see before we hit the Infinity War as well. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I think it comes out in the February, and then it's the May that you've got the Infinity War coming mm. out. So, you know that you know there's going to be a lot building up before the Black Panther film comes out. So, I, I think it'll be an interesting character to look at before you move on to sort of bringing the Avengers back in, because it's going to be sort of discovering another new character. You know, you've only seen him for a little bit here, in the same yeah. way that you've only seen a little bit so far of Spider-Man. Mm. You know, you're, you're getting to see a bit more of his situation. And I think um, Chadwick Boseman definitely has enough presence to carry, not just his own film, but probably uh, a, certainly a lead in future Avengers films, so they possibly don't have everybody we're used to. You're probably right in that with the actor. I think my concern would be more over the character, because I do remember him... F- from the Avengers cartoon, I can't can't date it in my head. Craig, you'd be there's some mightiest heroes, the the one, yeah, the one that got cancelled, even though it's yeah. better than the current one. I had the same thought in watching that as I did with this. He is a very interesting character to watch, and he's got lots of things going for him here that could that he can use to solve problems well, but he never seems to have great weakness. In the cartoon, he would be the person who turned up and made a wise comment. <laughs> and then he would be the character that turned up and won the fight. <laughs> and he would always... And, and it was it was done well enough. I never... I didn't dislike any of it, I have to say. But then if he gets his own film, where's his... What, I don't know. I honestly don't know what problem he's going to have. He can throw money at it. He can throw his royalty at it. He can throw his amazing physical abilities at it. He's totally wise. It's just he's just going to win. Yeah, I think from a character point of view, he could have the same sort of clout that Stark does at the moment. Uh, if Iron Man's not there anymore, if Robert Downey Jr.'s not there anymore, then he could be the almost the money behind everything, I suppose, as well as some of the muscle because he has his vibranium suit. And they didn't really tackle his intelligence in this film, but certainly in the comics and the cartoon, he's a mechanical genius. Well, he's sort of smart enough to follow Stark. He's got the charisma to sort of chair those meetings. Yeah. He, that bit of diplomacy. I mean, he is a he is a leader. Yeah. You know, so it is it is that kind of position that he could he could fill. Yeah, and I really liked that one scene he did with his dad. I mean, they only share one scene, but it was such a good one. It tells us a lot about the relationship, as in they they don't always see eye to eye, but they really respect each other. And I have the feeling that the sorry, I have the feeling that the the Black Panther film will be very similar to this, yeah. where it was called Captain America Civil War. I do have the feeling that that will be Black Panther, but there will be other characters put in there. I, I, I have a seeking suspicion that it's not just going to be a Black Panther film. Yeah, well, I mean, Bucky's frozen in Wakanda, isn't he? So, mm. And True. the Avengers, are, or the secret Avengers, are hiding out there as well. 
So yeah, I think they could probably try and shoehorn some someone in there. Who who I don't know, but still. Um, but yeah, he's a good he's a good thing for the franchise to have in the future. So there was another character introduced with a much smaller role, actually, um, the Amazing Spider Man, who is. And- uh, and yet, does does he not seem to have a bigger impact, even despite <laughs> yeah. the fact? More popular, though, but among the masses. Yeah, but um, he's come out of his custody battle with Sony, and he's allowed to play with his friends again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Finally allowed in the sandpit with everyone else. Yeah, and, and you don't see much of him, but certainly for me, being a big Spider-Man fan, he made a huge impression on me. I thought Tom Holland was, was really good as Peter Parker. And it didn't make me. Com- I didn't compare him to either of the other two. I did actually, but in a way that made me think I've always wanted to see this character and the other two. However many good points they had, just seemed to both pale away because of what they've done with this one. Yeah, well, I've always thought that Andrew Garfield was a great Spider-Man in the sense that he's confident, cocky, and wisecracks and stuff. And then Tobey Maguire was the better Peter Parker because he's tragic and nerdy. But Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker was always too cool for me. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Peter Parker should not be cool, ever. I think it's, uh, a lot of it is uh, like bit what like people say about policemen as well. Am I getting older or are the policemen getting younger? Yeah. And it seems like the older I get, the younger the Spider-Men are. Yeah. Um, but I think he, he does he, quite a good job. I mean, you don't get to see much of him to judge. But the relationship he had with the other characters, the wisecracks, the way he was acting, I thought was fantastic. I mean, mm. I mean, really, really good. Especially to to sort of shine out amongst all those characters, all those already established characters as well that you've seen in a lot more films. You might have seen a lot more of Spider Man, but not that Spider Man. Yeah. So you know, it's it it's trying to reinvent it again, trying to make it a bit different. You know, even having the younger Aunt May as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it all. You know, it sort of changes it a little bit, and I'm interested. I'm interested to see where they go next with it. Yeah, and you get a bit of a teaser of everything that the character's about in those few minutes of screen time he has. You know, the the first scene he has with Stark, he's he's getting to project some emotional depth, and then during the fight, he gets to be funny, and <laughs> you get to see him do his thing as well. And they they do manage to get in absolutely everything. I think yeah. that the character is. They even get in the the dead uncle, and they do it without using any words, and yeah. that's just perfect. We all know the story because we've seen it at least three times. Yeah, that what's going on, so it doesn't need to be there. So as soon as some reference is made to tragedy in your past, we all just know. Yes, I know exactly what it is, and fill in the gaps. And yeah. Being able to use our assumptions like that is a brilliant skill from a writer. I applaud just that scene alone for doing that. Yeah, it's incredibly well written, and it's the way. Yeah, the way he explains um, when you know when bad things happen and you don't do anything about them, they happen because of you. And it's it's a very kind of it's a naive viewpoint of heroism as well. I mean, that's the one bit that kind of makes me hit my head against against the chairs because the first films, the Tobey Maguire films, summed it up so great. With great power comes great responsibility. Where every, you know, every Spider-Man since has had to write about a hundred words round to get <laughs> to, to get the same sentiment out as that one phrase. Yeah. Uh, you know, you sort of sit there, go, just say, "With great power comes great responsibility." Job done. <laughs> See, no, I, 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 I totally get your point on that because of the power of the statement that comes yeah. with it. The weight of history that comes behind that phrase is is undeniable. But the phrase that they used in this film, where, which Craig, you just actually gave where he, he talks about if you stand by and do nothing seemed to fit a 17 year old so much better it was the language that this person would use because great power comes great responsibility is something i can see the 60 year old martial arts expert <laughs> saying that but the words used in this film fitted much better the teenager i actually much prefer it the way it was done here i think he's actually 15 in, in this uh, and then even better because <laughs> yeah. it shows the, you know you don't have that ability to construct poetic language as a 15 year old well most of us didn't i didn't yeah. so i appreciated that struggling to try and find a way of putting that across in in w- words that i would have had i'm fairly certain that his solo film will have the phrase in there somewhere but this isn't the time nor the place for it really no. uh, you just need to get a quick look at his motivations 
you know, he's in, he likes to do good because he feels like it's his fault if he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I think it's certainly it's, it's naive enough for a fifteen-year-old to think that he has to do, he has to save everyone, and he has, you know, he has to devote all his time to helping others uh, when there's possibly better ways to do it. I mean, he obviously still has a lot to learn because he's only fifteen. And that could be his film. You yeah, mean, that, be, that could have encapsulated that right there. Yeah. Yeah, building building up to that phrase. Yeah, I've always thought the best Spider-Man stakes are when he has to fight a supervillain, and if he doesn't defeat the villain by ten o'clock in the morning, he's going to miss a test that makes up his grade for the rest of the year or something. You know, and that's that is the kind of stakes that he does. You know, yeah. Or he's going to his friends are going to think he's flaky again because he misses out on this important thing that they want him to see. Or absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's just yeah, they're big stakes for him, but not. You know, I don't suspect that Spider-Man will be saving the world as we know it in his solo film. And if he is, then I'll be annoyed. Yeah, that would be rubbish. That's not what he's about, and that's not what he should be. Um, I mean, it does happen sometimes. You know, every now and again he's in something that has world-ending stakes, but it shouldn't be every film. No, he's a street-level hero, so yeah. he should stay there, yeah. Yeah. I, I do think it's it's one of those things because of this universe, because we know all these people are around in this exact universe, why would you not call them? You've got the ability to speak to them and they've got the ability to see what's <laughs> actually going on as well. They can see and go, oh, he's struggling a bit there. It'd be a good idea if we go and help because that could yeah. end the world. Okay, we'll go and help him. Okay, great. Yeah, That was the you know, best part of Ant-Man, by the way. That, is the, that whole film, I could have just watched that one part of step <laughs> one. We call the Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it more happens in Ultimate Spider-Man, the, the comics, because in those comics, Spider-Man turns up a bit later, like he does here. Uh, you know, there's already, the Avengers already exist, or the Ultimates, as they're called. And, uh, um, and he's just this solo hero that's figuring himself out. But there, there is a point where he d- is trying to get in touch with more experienced heroes, because he doesn't feel like he can handle something. Uh, and there was also one where he spent the entire issue trying to get out of school to go and fight a bad guy. And by the time he got there, Iron Man had dealt with it. <laughs> Which, you know, that's the kind of thing I'd like to see. And yeah. that'd be a good, good way to have, because Robert Downey Jr. is in the Spider-Man film. So that, that'd oh, be a good, good way to have him in. It's like, uh, uh, thanks for coming, kid. Uh, wrapped this up half an hour ago. Yes. You know, like something like that. Uh, although there's, it's a little bit questionable, uh, Stark recruiting him, because... People have said it online that you know he's essentially a child soldier in this case. Well, that seems a little bit harsh. I mean, he can stop moving cars just by standing in front of yeah. them. You know, he can shoot webbing. It's not, and he wasn't indoctrinated from birth into an ideology of fighting that <laughs> that he can't be taken out of. It's, I'd like you to come along and do this thing that you're already really good at. And fits your existing ideology. I know you're a bit young, but actually you're clearly a prodigy moving towards this already. And that seems a lot different than just whacking a rifle in his hand and telling him <laughs> to shoot women. I mean, yeah. It does seem that Tony puts him to one side and goes, right, you chase the guys over there, but keep out of the fire in this main yeah. battle until, does, you know, yeah. until you're needed. You know, stay out of the way and hopefully yeah. we won't have this fight at all. And when hopefully Tony thinks he's line a, up and go, no way. Yeah. yeah, and when Tony thinks he's seriously hurt, he's, he looks really um, conflicted about it. Yeah. And then once he realises he's fine, he's like, oh, thank God, you're going to stay here or I'll tell your aunt that you're Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> And that works, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he, he kind of admits that he's injured and just lies there. And then that's the last you see of him. His contribution to that toy fight in the middle is, is really good. I mean, he gets his moment with everyone. Yes. Uh, and I quite like how they subtly tell you what his powers are without, you know, without telegraphing them. So it's a bit where he stops Bucky's metal arm with his with his with just his hand yeah. uh, effortlessly. And then later on when he lifts the, um, the walk-on bridge thing. Uh, but he, he looks like he's struggling a bit with that. So you're getting the impression that's his upper limit. Or approaching his upper limit. I mean, it's good that they... It sounds like they're not going to go all the way through the origins again. You know, they know that we've already seen this two, three, <laughs> four times. You know, we've read about it for long enough. You know, we yeah. understand what this character can do. You don't need to, to flag it up to everyone. And also, they, I don't think they've got the time to sort of sit there and do all yeah. that. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's one of those. Yeah. There's even a hint at spider sense in the film. Uh, it's where he, where he jumps on a wall and then it's when, I think, Falcon throws something at him. And he says, oh, God, before he dodges it. Oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah, it's a very subtle thing, again. 
Oh, well, yeah, brilliant, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's you know it's really funny when he talks about that really old movie. Oh, and how it comes back. <laughs> yeah, I did feel old at that point. I was <laughs> I, I was with Iron Man just for the, that point alone as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I do like that uh, that Tony won't tell anyone else about him as well. You know, he keeps it a secret. Well, they are going to have a father son relationship, and and that's fine. It does work. It really absolutely worked for, for yeah. thing. Yeah. So. Interestingly, Spider-Man, such a small role, but such a big impression. Definitely. Yeah. Even Cap's impressed by him, you know, essentially yeah. he has heart and then and they bond over the fact that they're from low rent neighbourhoods in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing a solo film, I think. Um, this has got to be the one that gets it right. Third time lucky. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to think with him looking over it and, you know, combining him into this universe where he probably should have been in the first place, you know. Yeah. You're like, you know, surely they can't get it wrong this time. Yeah. There's a lot of eyes on them, that's for sure. Well, I think they've earned the trust. As long as the writers and director of his film follow on from this example, they've earned our trust. Mm. Yeah. I, I just want them to keep it small enough. You know, he has a villain that challenges them, but not one that would challenge the Avengers. That's just... Yeah, that's all you need, really. So we've already touched on action sequences. We've talked about the, the raid one. But the, the big one is the, the middle, the midsection of the film with the, the airport fight. And um, I mean, just in terms of the execution, what do people think of how these are put together? Uh, it, it was certainly the spectacle of the film. Yeah. No challenge on that. They used everybody's power. They shrunk something with I, with uh, Ant-Man. They, they, they uh, uh, made something bigger with with with, with Ant Man. They've got uh, Hawkeye using his arrows against uh, Black Panther. Um, they've got Black uh, Black Widow changing sides. Almost they they bring everybody in and touch everybody's important powers and character points at least once. I think which is which is exactly what it needed to happen. It was just a fun event. Nobody's going to die. Everything's going to be fine. Let's just have a laugh. And they really covered all of it. I think. It was. It, I think it was a really good achievement that they managed to cover all those characters yeah. and and give them all their moment to shine, their moment to one up each other, you know, their little moment to have a little bit of flair. If it was a character that would sort of a joke, they got like in a few quippy remarks from everyone. It was. I think it was a really good achievement because otherwise it could have just been a big mess. It could have been an absolute disaster in the middle of the film. Oh, definitely. Considering that you're spending all this time building up to it, you know. So you're 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 basically recreating that sort of double page picture that you would get in a comic book of two, two sides coming right up against each other. Who's fighting who, and what are they doing? You know, I I I just thought they did a really great job of that. Mm. It must have been a nightmare for them to try and plan it and plot mm. it out because I imagine they left it for ages in the script as and then they fight, <laughs> <laughs> and no one wanting to flesh that out. Yeah, yeah, and. I think there was points where the script was in production where they didn't know what characters they were going to have as well. I mean, Spider-Man was a fairly late addition, I think. Um, they, apparently they wrote that big role for Black Panther because they didn't think they were going to get Spider-Man. And then they got him anyway. So they were like, well, we need to leave this Black Panther story because it's actually important to the, the rest of the film. So they wrote a smaller role for Spider-Man. And I think it works out better that way uh, yeah. in general. But um, in terms of just the fight, yeah, it's, it's really entertaining and I, for one, was surprised when uh, Ant Man became Giant Man. I think that <laughs> I wasn't was one of my highlights of yeah. it was seeing Giant Man and sort of Paul Rudd is just so great in that role. So yeah. going, oh my god, it worked! And then, <laughs> you know, oh yeah, you know, you know, he just can't believe it. And it's it's so much fun what he then does because he's basically throwing around about War Machine like a toy. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah, and it's. I mean, the the first Avengers film is very much a celebration of the fact that it merely exists. You know, the fact that against all odds they pulled this thing off and now they're on the well, the third time that these major characters are all together with some new ones. And again, it's a sequence that's another celebration of the fact that they've managed to get to this point. You know, where they've got everyone and they've got their powers fully realised and and they're all just... And you get to see what they can all do. It's kind of weird, actually, how it's kind of a shame that the fight seems to have zero stakes. Yeah. In that there's no, no one's going to be hurt. Nothing really bad's going to happen. Yeah. And you pretty much know that Captain America's just going to carry on and, and Stark is just going to keep following. And yet, despite that, it's still a really enjoyable watch. Yeah. I think that's, that's 
Yeah, stands out. Yeah, I mean, you know, who would have thought that 10 years ago or whenever they started this, it was 2008 that the first Iron Man came out, so nine, eight years ago, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, who would have thought that eight years ago you'd have a moment, you know, you'd have Giant Man standing on things while Spider-Man crawls on his face? Yeah. You know, it just yeah. seems insane that they got to this point, and I guess let them have their moment of indulgence. Absolutely, because even even as even as close as Ant Man was, Ant Man was the gamble film. Well, yeah. G- Guardians was as well, but uh, Ant Man was this weird little side film. Are we really going to use this Ant Man ants ants? That's a bit weird, isn't it? Can we really <laughs> get the public to watch Ant Man? Yeah. Turns out, yes, you can, and they love it. <laughs> yeah, of course he no. doesn't use his ants in this film, but, no. <laughs> but or does he? You couldn't see them. Yeah, well. <laughs> He stands on them all when he becomes giant man. <laughs> I mean, I would like to have seen them trying to clear up a giant, you know, if he didn't shrink down at the yeah. end, you know, just this airport. With a huge, you know, how, how would they do that? About 20 Chinooks or something trying to well, carry him away? calling the Hulk. <laughs> well, he's he's off in Thor's film at the moment, so they don't know where he is, actually. Not Terms available in this apply. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the reason that Hulk and Thor aren't in this film is because the, there's no one else they could fight in that sequence no. other than each other. No, that's the massive problem that, and that's the vision problem again, it's yeah. something you have to be very careful with. Yeah, yeah. so we're all, we're all going to switch partners and fight about and uh, you two stand over here and just not lump it out with each other until we decide Actually to switch partners is perfect description of this film mm-hmm. because it essentially was just one big dance Yeah. Uh, sorry, that fight scene was one big dance that was it. Yeah, toy fighting in the playground Yeah, absolutely <laughs> You would almost you could almost get the same out of an Avengers training sequence. I did yeah. like them putting uh, Sam and Bucky together as well. I do think you know I, I I didn't mention them earlier on when we were talking about the other characters, but I think mm. the two of them and the way they were hitting off each other yeah. during that, providing a bit of sort of light relief as they're trying to deal with Spider Man running about, yeah. I, I I just thought was done so well. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, definitely. through the thing. I mean, those two characters really, really came along. I thought. I like their mutual hatred, mm. even though well, it doesn't that, actually come it, from yeah. anywhere. You know, other than I guess Bucky's tried to kill Sam a couple of times. I think it's more jealousy over uh, over Steve. I think I think they both like Steve and want to be his best buddy. You know, it's that it's that Steve's kind my of friend. competition. That's <laughs> it. Steve's boyfriend. You know, there's a bit of bromance going on in there, and they, yeah. you know, they don't want the other one to have a shot. You know, yeah, and. Um, yeah, uh, the actor's names escaped me. The the guy that plays Falcon, uh, Anthony Mackie. Anthony Mackie. That's it. Yeah, uh, the line delivery when he says no when he, uh, Bucky asks him to move his seat up is you know is pitch perfect. <laughs> I think he's been. He's actually. I was going to mention him earlier, but but I thought I'd miss my chance. I'd like to bring it in now. Actually, he's one of my favourite characters from uh, all the Captain America films, possibly just because of that actor. I think his timing of every single line he's received from the moment where he does the sort of Joey from Friends How You Doing to Black Widow right at the start of of, of that introduction all the way through to two guys in a car watching their mate get his first kiss. You know, <laughs> yeah. Perfect, the whole thing. Yeah, he is very good. When they introduced Falcon, I wasn't sure what way it was going to go. Um, I think before Winter Soldier came out, I just assumed he was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Uh, obviously he isn't. But, and it's interesting how he... Um, he follows whatever Steve does because he believes in, in what Steve does anyway. You know, yeah, he men- perfectly he, reasonable, yeah. yeah. He mentions in Winter Soldier, I do what he does, just slower. Yes. Uh, and Bucky is more of a, he's more of a means to an end in both films, actually. He doesn't really, he doesn't get much to do on his own in this one. No, but he's, no, but he's not a main character. He's a plot point. I yeah. mean, that's, not everybody can be sent to stage. I mean, there is that nice moment he has with uh, with Steve where they, where they talk about um, some girl that he was trying to impress and, uh, he says she would be a hundred years old years old by now, and Steve says so are we. So yeah, I did think that was a nice sort of a little bit of development. You know that there's still you know you, you're like well this character can still be rescued. You know he's obviously yeah. broken. He's got you know whatever they've done to him. You know the programming that they've done to him. You yeah. know this this you know the character is still there. The one that you saw during uh, the first you know the first Avenger, the Captain America first film. Mm. You know that that character is still there, you know, just, you don't know at any moment, he can just switch. Yeah. And I also liked it when he was, when he said to Steve, well, I'm not worth this, all this, all that's went on, it's essentially for him, and he doesn't feel like he's worth it. I mean, it's the standard sort of tortured, former killer, 
thing, but they sell it quite well, I think. Yeah, yeah. the action sequences. I was going to mention the final, you know, the final fight that we mm. get. I, th- I think I kind of agree with you where you say, I, I, by that time, I was a bit of fight fatigued by the end of it. I, I didn't understand why one didn't escape. You know, if, if at the end of that they'd escaped and they'd both been left sort of cursing at the sky going, oh, Oh, you know, <laughs> I, I think I think I would have quite happily had it finished there, rather than you know watching a what seemed like a very very elongated fight to the end. I mean, you, you know, Iron Man loses his suit once it's all broken to pieces, and Bucky finally loses his arm. Yeah, you know, it's uh, but you could have done that a lot quicker. Yeah, well, it, there I, was one point in that fight that was in that I wanted to bring up that I thought. Oh, you should have done this sooner because that's just brilliant. Um, even though I agree, I didn't need the fight. I, w- I was totally beyond it. Definitely the same as you there. But the point where Iron Man says to his new AI, who I think somebody named earlier, but Friday, I can't, Friday, Friday yeah. he says to he says to Friday, uh, analyze his fight pattern, and Friday just does it, and mm. then the AI takes over the suit and wins the fight. Yeah, I thought that's just brilliant. Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> and you definitely should have done that. Push that button yeah. earlier. You know, you do wonder why he didn't deploy that earlier. All. So the, the the scene where they are sharing the shield between them to fight Iron Man, I thought was particularly well done. I did mm. like that. But like you say, they could have got round to all that a lot quicker. Yeah. You yeah. know, and then got them escaping out the hatch at the top and disappearing, you know, and him left, you know, there at the bottom. I, th- I think it, it it didn't need to be as long as it was. Yeah. I liked I actually liked the, the fight sequence and it was an interesting contrast to the you know, the superhero play fight, uh, because it was a lot more visceral. Uh, they, they were fighting is, to hurt each other oh they are and that's whereas where that's true and it, it's not a bad thing that they're having this fine it's just it, it is about the placement it's it's a p- brilliantly choreographed setup but it comes at the point where the chords are forgotten where it's down to a f- just this itchiness about someone's mother and who knew what mm. and the whole thing just doesn't have any of that connection to where we started it's just these two guys have stayed in the same flat together for too long and it's finally just been someone's taken the last beer without replenishing it and they're <laughs> just going to beat on each other now until one of them's gone and you just think i, I want i would have happily taken that point but i would have happily taken it earlier when it's a fight about something not i won't say that the, the you know his mother dying is meaningless but it's just it doesn't seem to have the power of the original argument, you mm. know, maybe we could have just moved it on so it's the extension of the toy fight, you know, yeah. and they do that fun bit and then something else happens and these two are left by themselves and they just cannot agree and they both have to try and achieve something, but it's the opposite side of a coin, this choice they have to make and they end up having to fight over whether the button is or is not going to be pushed. I think that just would have made it that you weren't just saying, I'm glad we got here because that fight looks good. It would have been, I really, really need to know who wins this fight now because it's the summation of the entire fight over the Accords epitomized by these by the two sides of the argument in human form. And that mm. just would have been much more powerful, I think. It does end quite powerfully, though, when, when Cap gives up his shield, which um, obviously we're, we know was a part of him in all. Well, I I would agree, but it's just the point where Stark says you don't deserve that shield. And my response is, you're damn right he doesn't deserve that shield. And when he gives it up, I don't feel like Captain America surrendered something because he's already surrendered his ideology a lot earlier. To me, it wasn't a big moment. I know it should have been, but it really wasn't. To me, it it felt like he was definitely just not going to be a part of this anymore. Because obviously the shield is the American flag or at least a representation of it. So it's like, it's almost like the thing that he stands for isn't the same thing that he always stood for. But do you not think the the sort of sentiment in that and I'm leaving the shield and I'm going, right, I'm off, I'm away, is all kind of written out really quickly at the end when he opens the box, he reads the note and it says, here's a mobile phone, yeah. I'm still your buddy, love you lots, kiss, kiss, kiss. <laughs> uh, you know, you know on, honestly, pal, we'll all get over it, it's no problem, I'll, I'll be around for tea on Tuesday, um, <laughs> let me know when Thanos gets here, um, I'll speak in a bit. You know, it's... That that kind of I, I would have rathered it, it basically rolled credits pretty much at that point. 
yeah. than to turn around and go, well, do you know what? Actually, this fight now means nothing. I've, 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 we're all over it, aren't you? Aren't you, Tony? Aren't you over it? Okay, cool. Yeah, that, I, I think, would have been more powerful and possibly left people going, oh, what is going to happen yeah. now? But well, leaving, the, leaving that emergency phone there kind of goes, well, they're just going to come back out of yeah. retirement at some point and everyone off forgiving each other. Yeah, there's those, yeah. Um, I mean, there's the bit where, uh, where Ross phones Tony and, uh, you know, we put, it's, there's been a breach at the raft and, and Tony just puts him on hold as if to say, you know, I don't care. You know, yeah, it's that's like, a nice comedy moment, yeah. but it's exactly what Chris yeah. is saying. It's almost like the comedy of that moment is then more important than this yeah. meaningful ending. Yeah. So it's um, you know Steve Rogers has broken into the raft and he's uh, he's freed all of his his buddies that you helped bring in. And I suppose at that point Tony should have just been like, oh, he's at it again. Yeah. Well, then that, at that point he should assemble the remaining Avengers and go because he's signed the accords <laughs> and he's been told what to do. But no, he yeah. puts it on hold. He, he, <laughs> that's that's the point where you're like, okay, so he, he really doesn't care about what he signed anymore. That that's now completely gone because yeah. you know. Yeah. So at that point he would go right well we've got to strike into action and go and solve this but you know no i agree i think again that, that it's the same thing about everything that's where that after that to our market it seems to undermine the, the, the start slightly the accord slightly i mean there it is a bit of a non-ending in the sense that you have no idea what's where it's going next if i mean i suppose you shouldn't have to know how it goes next based on this film but it's just you know the last scene being him uh, breaking into the raft to to free all the others uh, it, it's fine in a sense, but you, you kind of get no idea where everyone is at the moment, you know, what's going to go on. I think Chris has called the, the the next set of films, whatever they are, I think Chris already called it when he said that it's going to be two separate teams. Mm. I, I mean, I, I guess that the even the Black Panther film that's coming, it, it, it could be team Captain America and, and his guys in Wakanda, it could be. I, yeah. I, and then the other team have to deal with some rubbish that Saw leaves them. Yeah. Maybe they are just going to split off into two groups. I yeah. do suspect that you will see them in Black Panther, and then possibly you'll have Tony Stark's Avengers in, at the beginning of Infinity War, which is you know supposedly the, the two parts, and then they all unite at the end. I mean, the yeah. next time that we see what is happening on Earth, you know, you've got Doctor Strange coming up, which I don't yeah. think will really touch on it, hint on it maybe. They're not touching it. Then you're all the way across space and Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. So you're not, you, you know, the, they are shifting the camera angle away to basically allow anything to happen at this point. Yeah. Yes. You know, you, you're not going to know what has actually happened until you get very far. You know, you're talking about into a, a good year or so until you know what's actually happened. Yeah, there'll, there'll be some mention of it in Spider-Man, I think. I imagine um, there'll be some sort of cover, but since Iron Man's in it, there'll, there'll have to be some kind of chat uh, about what's going on. But it might just be yeah, little bits of exposition just yeah. to keep you up to date. It, it might not be a big part of the film. I mean. oh, it's not going to be the. Uh, it's not going to be a plot moving revelation. I don't think. I mean, no. of course that, that that shouldn't happen in these solo films. You know, they they no. do have to exist as films more than anything else. I think you'll probably end up seeing a bit of newsreel footage or something during Spider-Man yeah. of, you know, yeah. them on a chase trying to hunt down Steve Rogers or, you know, sightings of yeah. being reported or, you know, it'll be something yeah. along those lines. But I don't think we're truly going to find out much until yeah. you get towards Black Panther, really. Yeah, mysterious, mysterious group bring down terrorists yeah. there'll be a lot of post credit yeah. stings i think i think yeah. that's where we're going to that's probably where we're going to get the most let's let's be honest after waiting five minutes through the credits that's where <laughs> yes. we're going to find out the most agents yeah. of shield will probably mention a few things oh he could join shield how about that yeah, yeah that maybe no okay yeah they, i imagine they'll bring up the state of play in agents of shield here and there they do reference these things in dialogue quite a lot see that's so annoying because that means and my I have to watch more <laughs> Shield in order to get this knowledge. I don't want to do that. <laughs> it'll be nothing that gives you the. Um, it'll be nothing that gives the game away. But it'll be you know Coulson will see a report on something or, or yeah. whatever. You know, it's, uh, there'll be a tie into Doctor Strange, but they're they're bringing in magic. But that's another podcast probably. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's all that. I mean, the, I'm not sure where it will go next because you won't see these characters together for quite some time. I mean, it's that only a couple of years, but you won't. You know, there'll be a lot of films between here and there. I mean, pay- Ending contract negotiations, possibly never again. <laughs> After that point, yeah. After Infinity War Part Two, it'll be like there are no, there is no figure that Downey Junior will agree to to appear in these things anymore. Um, I mean, I, I have to admit, I feel like I should be for the benefit of this podcast coming up with this prediction of the future, but <laughs> I am struggling. I really admit that. I, I think that's the great thing about the, the way Marvel have done it is at the end of every film, you're debating what happens, what's the ramifications for all these other characters that yeah. we haven't seen. What do they think about what's happened? You know, yeah. it, I, I think that's what's great about the universe that they've built. Whereas in a lot, you 
No, in the other particular universe <laughs> that we've mentioned quite a lot today, you're kind of like, I, I don't think anyone else has a particular care about what's going on here. You know, you yeah. don't get any sort of hint of that during Suicide Squad or, or you know, pro, you know, Batman v Superman. You kind of don't get that. Oh, I wonder what the rest of the characters are up to and why they weren't there yeah. or what they're doing, which is so important that they're not there. But you kind of you kind of come up with these plots with the Marvel film and you're like, oh, I wonder what so and was with up. Yeah, maybe that's the longevity. Maybe the fact that it's just been going for so many years. Now there are so many characters. Mm. They have spent a lot of time building it and there's their reward. That yes. is. Was, was Nick Fury just watching this on TV? <laughs> what, <was laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. what, what were they doing? You know, what about all these other characters? That you see? I, I, I just find it really interesting and I, I think the way they've built the universe up is fantastic. Yeah. It is. And they're currently laying the groundwork for the the next generation of um, of lead leads in these films because they know that they've all probably only got some of these actors for a finite amount of time. I mean, when Chris Evans says that's it, you know, are people going to accept a new Captain America? Maybe in five to ten years, but not right away. Uh, same with, well, particularly with Tony Stark. You know, Robert Downey Jr. has owned the role so much that it's difficult to replace him. Almost impossible, I'd say. Yeah, and it will get to the point where um, Chris Hemsworth is obviously forty-five, yes. and and can't be this ageless god anymore. Aye, you know. Um, so there there is a shelf life on these characters in a sense, and in, in a way that you don't get in the comics. You know, so it might get to the point where someone dies and it's permanent, just because the actor will never come back. That is better though, because. I think the trouble I have, I've, I've sometimes wondered if I should get into reading some of the, uh, these comics just to see where all this came from. But when you look for jumping on points now, everything is so convoluted. And I use that word over complex because I think because it's been decades, you know, there really is just this mess of stuff that it, it, it it's almost too difficult to get involved and really care whereas over a decade that's still a really long time yeah but i am invested in these people and it, it is important to me and if it's going to end it won't for that problem of becoming too complicated for its own good yeah the, the whole comic thing is interesting i understand why people see it as a daunting thing but i mean a, couple, a few years ago i just picked it back up and got back into it but i, I kind of have enough background from reading them before but the, the interesting thing that marvel certainly are doing right now is um when they're starting a new arc on a given book they tell you on the front cover of that issue first part of new story um so it doesn't stop there being a massive history behind it though no. And, and anyone, think, anyone that recommends you read, you, if you want to get into comics but feel a bit daunted by it, they just recommend that you pick up an issue of a character that you have an interest in. You read that issue. Uh, if you have any questions, look it up on Wikipedia to find out the answer. I mean, also they do sort of collections as well, sort yeah. of little compendiums of, you know, here's the, you know, sort of a little collection of Deadpool stories that we think you should be aware of. You know, that, yeah. that kind of thing. But I do think the movies... You know, as a fan, I love them. I've seen them all. I've seen several of them many times. So I sort of understand a lot of the characters in the background. But if you were just to jump off and start with Civil War, mm -hmm. there's a lot of assumption already there. You yeah. know, they assume that everyone's seen a Spider-Man film, everyone's seen this film, everyone knows why this character's like this, and this one's got and this one doesn't. And, you know, there, there's a lot of assumption in the Marvel films now that, well, with, you know, everyone went to see this and so many people saw that that, yeah. You know, we don't need to explain any of this anymore. But I do think that will start to become a barrier at some point, and it will start to yeah. scare some people off going because they're like, "Well, I, don't, I just don't understand what they understand what's going on because yeah. they just assume that we all know because we all saw the last one." I think as long as you're willing to just go with it. I mean, I said that back when the Avengers came out. You know, you could have it, it, it enhances it if you've seen all the solo films beforehand. But if you're one of those people that hasn't or have only seen one or two of them, as long as you're willing to accept that these characters exist and they do the things they do, then. You can you know you can find a way to get on with it. I do think this is the first of those films though that would have that barrier. Oh yeah, it's kind where of, yeah, there is it there is a lot you know that that would be a barrier to fresh people starting. Though I don't really I think that's the audience that they're trying to appeal to in the first place. But yeah. you know, it's still I, making billions of dollars. Is, so. Oh yeah, it's still I, I still think that's probably one of the few weaknesses in this film. You know, yeah. I'm I'm a big fan, so I you know I'm, I, I sort of fanboy out of these films. I love them. Mm. But there will be some people that are going, I, I don't know who that character is. Where, where did he come from? Where, yeah. Ant Man? Who's who's he? You know. And if they didn't go and see that film, if they didn't go, you know, it's. I, I, I do think that would be the one barrier to it. Yeah, and I, like you were saying with the with the comics, they they collect things in like trade paperback format, and you can um, you can pick them up 
And as long as you know, have, have a rough idea of Captain America, is, you could read Winter Soldier quite happily because it's a it's a cut and dry, self contained story, and any kind of and I think there's even flashback stuff that kind of give you an idea of his relationship with Bucky before. Um, well, the films sort of act as a bit of a gateway for some yeah. people as well, which is which is brilliant. Yeah, they, they're very comic accurate. So if you pick up a comic book and you see this character, and the comics are going out of their way to shift these characters to be more like their comic book counterparts in a lot of ways. Especially the newer ones. You know, they're releasing, releasing new Black Panther comics and it's kind of, he's back in Africa dealing with African stuff and, um, because that's where they're taking the films next. Yeah, I mean, you, you can always tell when it's a run up to a film because of that, that particular character suddenly has a lot, a lot of comic storylines yeah. coming out. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, but no, I, I, I do think if, if you are interested in the films and you really enjoy them, then do pick up a comic, give it a try. Mm. You know, it, it's different, but it's it's worth it. And I'd go so far to say is at the moment, they're not always very good. A lot of them are borderline unreadable, actually, but it's an enduring medium and I can see why people are put off by it. Yeah. Uh, and the film's doing a good enough job of being a little self-contained thing that you can just watch and you can get a flavour for these characters and it gives you a lot more... It gives you a bit more depth than you might be expecting as well. So there's that. I don't know if that's made uh, Aaron want to read any comics, but... Uh, you put off. me off when you said a lot of them are rubbish. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> if you went for some of the more celebrated trades, you'd probably get on well. Like, Too late. <laughs> like Winter Soldier, for instance. You could read that and see how it differs to the film. Not massively, actually. I mean, but there are significant differences, but in terms of the theme, it's kind of still there. So that was a good little adaptation. Civil War, if you read the Civil War comic, uh, I think it's pretty hopeless, actually. Um, it's vastly different from the film just because of the, um, the the amount of characters, the span of the universe at that point is massive. Yeah, um, and it suffers from problems like Tony Stark becomes a bit too much of a douche by the end of it and in the... Steve Rogers becomes annoying because he's so self righteous, and and other things too. It just it has so many ramifications that didn't need to happen. And yeah, it's a messy, messy story. Uh, one thing I actually forgot to mention about Bucky. Remember towards the start of the film where um, you first see Tony and he's wearing those glasses, watching his memories. Did that not seem like it was going to those glasses were going to be used on Bucky to help him deal with traumatic memories? Because there was lots of mention of the fact that he remembers killing everybody. I think they could have done that, but it probably would have shot the film down too quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, okay, we're going to interview this guy. Uh, we think uh, he might be murderous. Oh, put these on. Oh, hang on. That's <laughs> my mum. Oh, right. Okay, now I'm going to kill him. Uh, <laughs> roll credits. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's something that could be potentially used in the future to fix them. Yeah. You know, when, when these characters all eventually reunite, and I think, you know, we're pretty much accepting it is going to happen at some point. That is the kind of technology that could be used to fix them. Yeah. You know, maybe that's sort of the reconciliation at the end is, you know, he gets that programming out of Bucky. Mm. Yeah. I think uh, Bucky's going to be a big part of it no matter what. I mean, the guy's signed up for nine films and he's done two. So, uh... And the Wakandans can give him a, a, a nice shiny new arm as well. Yes, made of vibranium. All the, all the technical toys that will be on the new arm. Yeah, yeah it's, I guess it's all to play for. Uh, I would like to see some real stakes. To, uh, not that I like seeing people die, but I think there needs to be one or two casualties that don't come back. I do think that the, the, the sort of universe itself is going to suffer if they don't, because people are going to go into them and go, oh, actually, there's no stakes here anymore. Yeah, yeah you there's know, just there's, a bit there's, of a laugh. There's stakes, yeah. there's stakes for the people on the ground. Uh, you know, <laughs> all, all the people that are running about and working in the skyscrapers that are constantly getting knocked down, they are, you know, they are at risk. But, mm. you know, the, the characters that we're watching on screen, they're all going to be all right in the end. They're going to be battered and bruised and upset. And then, you know... Uh, at the very, very end of the film, they're going to be absolutely fine. They're going to be completely over it and, you know, bit business as usual at the end, you know? Yeah. Well, Quicksilver so far stayed dead, but who cares? Not even his sister, apparently. <laughs> well, it was it was a character that got introduced right during that film. You know, I think at this point, you're needing to see one of the original Avengers, mm. you know, suffer. I think they hinted very, very heavily at one point that they were going to, you know, kill Hawkeye yeah. during the... Uh, <laughs> um, the, the other Avengers film and well I think that was Joss Whedon playing with their expectations they set him up for the tragic sacrifice and then swore well I think by that minute. film 
we were expecting. You know, we're yeah. like, well, the stakes, the stakes are massive here. This is, you know, this is going to be the moment where one of them, you know, and they suddenly realize and it, and it didn't happen. I think that's why, you know, it's, it's one of the film things in this film that I was expecting to happen. And I think would have made the stakes seem real. Mm. Especially when you're approaching some major big storylines later. Yeah. You know, I think it would make, make people sort of fear what's coming up. Someone has to not make it out of Infinity War, for sure. It'll be Thanos. I, I don't think Thanos will be. <laughs> <laughs> It's bound to be Vision. I mean, in order for Thanos to achieve his plan, Vision has to die. It could, it could, yeah, that that could be the, the case at the end, yeah. yeah. Or it could be he never gets that stored and then that's why he's defeating you. Yeah. You well, know, you never. We we don't know these things. Hopefully, they're not listening in a writers' meeting right now, taking <laughs> notes because we've, we've scattered so many ideas out there. Now. Yeah. Oh, well, but the, if these come true, I'm expecting payment, Marvel. Well, the the directors of these the, these films do watch honest trailers. I think it's in the deleted scenes for Winter Soldier. The Russos mentioned that they um they saw the honest trailer for the first one, and they, and they were frightened to see what what they would pick <laughs> apart. And there's even a uh, I'll I'll need to try and find it for the show notes. But there's a video where the Russos turn up and watch sit through the honest trailer to Winter Soldier, which is really funny because they they talk about, um, okay, yeah, that's on us, we did that, okay, now you're just nitpicking, etc., you know, that kind of stuff. So that'd be quite funny. But, and I'm wondering if, uh, in this film, you know, you've got the giant white letters that tell you where they are, mm-hmm. uh, all the, like Vienna or wherever, and but it doesn't yeah. tell you where in the world Vienna is. Do you think that's? I wonder if that's them trying to stop cinema sins from <laughs> from poking at that, you know, in, in case yeah, you as as opposed to yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it could be you know it could be one of those things. There isn't it isn't massive lettering and all that sort of stuff. I yeah. do I, you know it, it's <laughs> it's an easy way to set a scene, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> this is exactly where we are. Okay, yeah. At least it doesn't do sort of the time, the day, you know, the t- time of day it is. Yeah. <laughs> Daytime and you are all right, great, yeah, because the sun's out. You can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we should about wrap this up. Uh, we've had some good discussions this evening. I think um, still haven't still haven't got to the bottom over what they're actually fighting about towards the end. But uh, who does? Who knows? Do they know? I think it was because of Martha. <laughs> Martha, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Try not to compare it to Batman v Superman. The nerds will be angry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we just get angry at ourselves. Yeah, it's impossible not to compare it, though, isn't it? I mean, there are two films about superheroes that fight each other. Yeah, which, which one revealed that they were going to be doing that this year first? I, I, would, I would like to know. I can't remember who announced first that they were going to be pitting their their heroes against each uh, other. Batman v Superman was the first announcement. Oh, they announced it at Comic Con not long after Man of Steel came out, and then. Marvel did a whole slate of rumours where the Civil War was one of them, and then eventually they did a an event where they announced what the next whack of films were going to be. And uh, so they announced it was Civil War that was coming out the same release date as Batman v Superman. And then DC were the ones to budge uh, from that release date because Marvel weren't going to. Just bit, yeah. I don't know. I enjoy them both, so I don't, I don't like fighting over them. They've got their good points, both of them. Yeah. I'll take the DC TV universe over the film universe. Though. Definitely. Yeah. And the Marvel TV universe and the film universe are the same universe. So there's no real comparison in terms of or comp- contrast as, as such. The TV universe just hides from the other one. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, we were all on holiday that week. We didn't see anything happen. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Daredevil was busy. Daredevil was busy and Jessica Jones was in a drunken stupor somewhere. Yeah, yeah. so I think uh, the TV stuff is a different podcast, but just as a wrap-up, final thoughts, Aaron, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, uh, can do. Um, I did like the film. Uh, I would have somehow wanted to have ditched the last half an hour, I think, um, but up until that I was fine. Definitely enjoyed the fight scenes. But there's uh, something weird about the whole Captain America thing that bothered me throughout. So I'm proud to say that I'm on Team Iron Man. <laughs> okay, and Chris? Uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a good film. I, 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 I just can't decide at the end, to be honest. I'm kind of torn between the two camps. But I've got to say, Tony kind of changes. He, he goes rogue at the end. He goes off the, the thing that he was fighting for in the first place. So... Yeah, I think I think I've got to go Team Captain America. 
Uh, I would say I'm on team both because I know they're all going to get along. <laughs> at the end. Um, Impartial. In I'm middle. on. I'm on team Spider-Man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, honestly, I, by the end of the film, it's a bit murky, and I'm not sure who I agree with more than anyone else in those in the context of this because they both raise good points about it, and they they both act unreasonably at different parts as well. So um, by the end of it, they've both both ditched their original sides and they're both working pretty much in the middle so yeah they've kind of made the decision for us so yeah there'll, there'll be some yelling and then there'll be a reconciliation and they'll all save the world together and then there'll be a decision that the avengers are okay on their own and we can leave them because we need them and they all live happily ever after yes <laughs> yeah. until, <laughs> until the next alien invasion and until the post credit sting where we see what's coming next <laughs> so Thank you very much to both of you for joining me for this this discussion. Cool, cheers. And we um, we will see you on the next podcast, whenever that may be. Hello. Uh, if there is a next one, who knows? Maybe Thanos and Odin stop us. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Before we go our separate ways and and go create separate podcasts about different issues. I don't know what point I'm dragging on about here. Thank you both for coming on, and that's a wrap. Goodbye. See you. Right. And that was our discussion on Captain America Civil War. Thanks to Aaron and Chris for joining me in the discussion, as well as YouTubers DSC and Endstens1117 for the supplied music. Also, join me in wishing a heartfelt congratulations to regular contributors to Neil Before Blog and Neil Before Pod, Angus and Natalie, who were married on September 24th. To each other, obviously. I hope to see them back on the podcast after a well-earned break. As always, you can find us on iTunes, YouTube, and all other major podcasting apps. So please seek us out and hit the subscribe button. That's all for now, so I hope you'll join us on the next Neil Before Pod.